Mr. J was a fairly wealthy man. Back in high school, he had been nicknamed the deputy, but that was more because he always wore a black suit and red tie in all weathers, whether it was winter or summer. Jay never wore anything else. It seemed like that suit was the only thing in his closet. But no, it was just that he had five of these jackets and pants. What kind of ties? The choice was huge, from the usual basic black bow tie to a red tie with flowers. Of course, Jay didn't become an MP, but that aristocratic thing remained in him forever. At the more mature age of 30, he began collecting watches. What else is a wealthy man who has built a career on art to do? Yes, art. It would seem that how can a person who knows culture and knows about paintings and books earn so much? But he can, and he can do it well. Jay was an example of that. Humanity's professions are often undervalued by society, and for good reason. The arts are much more complex than math and engineering. It's about feeling. If he had become a prosecutor or a deputy, he would never have acquired this skill. But he made the right choice, followed his heart. And while his classmates sweated at work in stuffy offices, he gave lectures, visited museums, conducted seminars, then became a famous film critic. All these fields of activity, of course, over time began to bring him quite a large income. He bought a beautiful house outside the city, a house that was surrounded only by a forest of spruce trees. Those trees always soothed him. He found peace in the rustling of those branches, in the smell of the place, in the atmosphere itself. Often, sitting by the fireplace and reading a book, he would look back at the view from his panoramic window, as if envying himself. It was indeed spectacular. With him sat his faithful dog of royal breed and quietly wagged his tail, putting his clever head on his master's knee and looking at the vastness, as if he too felt this power, the power of this place. It was really mystical, special. Sometimes you sit at the foot of a fir tree, look up, and there sits an owl. This majestic and wise bird looks at you, and you keep your eyes on it. Either you are afraid of scaring it away, or you are really communicating with this mysterious creature. Jay told his grown-up daughters about his experiences. Well, life in the city sounds a lot better to me. At least I haven't met any maniacs. Hannah, the youngest daughter, laughed as she put a sugar cube in her cup of green tea. Oh, you've seen enough of these horror movies, now you're fooling around, the eldest replied. Both daughters were in their twenties, and Jay had turned fifty last month. He looked very respectable for his age. Sometimes his daughters called him Vintage Dad. Jay laughed. It didn't embarrass him or make him angry. On the contrary, he liked growing up, gaining experience. He was getting better every year. Just like the expensive French wine in his cellar. Well, Diana, what's your opinion on that? Jay laughed, crossing his arms in a business-like manner. About what? The older woman asked, finally sitting down at the table. She liked tea, but pouring it into each mug was torture even though there were only four people at the table. Her father, her sister, her and her husband. But still, her father and sister were visiting her today. So she had to prove herself as a real hostess. Where would you like to live? Jay clarified his question, not taking his serious gaze off his daughter. I'm comfortable here. The city is a place of opportunity for me. What would I do in the middle of nowhere? I don't know how to answer that either. Dad? I'm not you who reads a book, tells the world about it, criticizes it, and gets a few thousand bucks for it. Jay laughed. You're exaggerating, Hannah. My main income comes from lectures to upperclassmen. That's how you made your fortune? Hannah said sarcastically. Oh, please. What kind of fortune? Well, I bought a house in the woods. What of it? In fact, I'm just a regular professor who just teaches cultural studies. Uh-huh. You're also a philanthropist. You also bought downtown apartments for your two daughters. Diane Ray's husband laughed. You should, too. Jay highly recommended it. Alex and I go to the orphanages every week, by the way. You can't imagine how many clothes accumulate after the theater shows. They restitch the costumes, and they make great clothes for the kids, Hannah said. Where's Alex, by the way? Haven't seen him in a while. Where's my brother-in-law? Jay faked outrage. Dad. Hannah shushed him. First of all, he's not your son-in-law. And second of all, I told you at the beginning that he was sick and couldn't come. I wasn't at the beginning. I was late. You know how traffic is on Friday nights. 
Traffic called the flower store. Diana grinned, nodding at the three bouquets and vases her father had given her. Jay was even embarrassed, but he didn't show it, just laughed with everyone else. He loved his daughters more than life. They were the only reminder of his dead wife, Rebecca. How much they were like that beautiful woman. Just as kind and compassionate. Beautiful and so sweet at the same time. Jay tried to do everything for them. He felt it was his duty as a father, provided them with apartments, offered them money all the time, but the girls refused. They wanted to achieve everything honestly, by their own labor, and their father understood them. He was very proud of his daughters, who were so eager to be independent. A few minutes passed, and Jay broke the silence again. When am I going to have grandchildren? Everyone choked on their tea and then laughed out loud. Dad, you're a joker today. In the comedians decided to go into comedy? Choking on her tea, Hannah squeezed out. Why, don't you want to give me heirs? Dad, we're your heirs. I don't think it's too early to think about grandchildren. Hannah just turned 23. She's a girl like me, Diana replied intelligently. Yes, my dears, you're right. Jay was a little sad by the end of the tea party. He very rarely spent time with his family. They were all busy setting up their own families now. Jay looked at this happy married couple of girls and Ray, then looked at Hannah, who was smiling, staring into the screen of her phone. Surely her lover must have texted her, and Jay thought to himself with some vague regret at how lonely and maybe even miserable he was. Those thoughts haunted him all the way back to the mansion. He was met by his only true friend, a dog named Fred, who was already three years old. If you counted in human years, he was about twenty-one. Well, a young man in his prime. Jay sat down by his favorite fireplace. Fred sat down next to him. I guess it's our fate, Fred, to be lonely, Jay said. You want a girlfriend, don't you? I'm sorry, friend, but I don't want any puppies. All the shelters are busy enough as it is. We don't need any more poor little dogs in the world. I'd like to save these poor things. Thinking of the shelters, Jay went to the round table and found a letter from the New Life Dog Shelter. Quite recently, Jay had donated about $3,000 to this shelter. It wasn't a very large sum, but it was better than nothing. Jay wasn't a greedy person. He just liked to distribute his income properly. And he divided the money among many organizations. The letter said, Dear Mr. Jay, we are very grateful for such a great contribution to our homeless animal shelter. We would like to express our gratitude to you. And as a presentation, we are sending you a collar. It's very durable. Your dog will definitely be well looked after. The envelope he did contain a spiked collar. Jay pulled it out and laughed. Can you believe they think I'm actually going to put this on you? He showed the collar to the dog as he sniffed the object with interest. They're so used to restricting the freedom of animals. What they need is just clean air and plenty of freedom of action, Jay reasoned. He sighed sadly, sat down on the couch, and began to prepare his report, which he would present at the lecture next week. He sent out invitations to all his acquaintances, family, relatives, and his students. The lecture was at the Museum of Modern Art. Jay had to get up at nearly five o'clock so he wouldn't be late for his own presentation. Of course, he wasn't the only one ranting. Various critics, lecturers, professors, writers, art historians, and other speakers came from all over the city. Often, Jay felt uncomfortable in such company. But today, he tried to fight his shyness. He was a professor, after all, and his thoughts had a right to be spoken along with the others. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Jay,' shouted one of his female students somewhere in the opposite corner of the hall. She ran towards him with a face that had a smile up to her ears. Jay really set this girl apart from the rest of his students. Not only was she a great thinker in the arts, but her looks were amazing. She looked like an elf, white as snow, straight hair and pointed ear tips. Her very face was very refined and the professor, although he was not a follower of the mass genre, could not help but remember the movie The Hobbit. After all, it was there that the eternally young, beautiful elves were portrayed in such a way. Good afternoon, Sophia. Jay smiled. What can I do for you? The lecture starts in half an hour. I just wanted to ask you when you have a seminar with the group, Sophia asked. Honestly, I haven't thought about it yet. I don't think I'll be able to make it to class on Wednesday but next week you can definitely wait. And, by the way, warn the others that the test is coming up. The girl almost glowed with happiness. Jay's exams were always a lot of fun. 
It was not a busy class, where the teacher called to the blackboard, as if for execution. No, it was completely different. They sat in a circle so they could see each other's eyes, and everyone answered the questions in order. And in the spring, these tests were held outside in the fresh air, which was even more beautiful. Sophia loved Jay's lessons. This teacher really had something to say, and the girl went into his every word. I'm very flattered by this attention, Jay admitted and almost bowed. Sophia was indeed his favorite student. Jay had high hopes for her. She was very capable and hardworking, and she did everything. She did reports, and often just brought some interesting materials for study, and they would work on them together with her classmates in class. It was not a faculty, but a dream. And it was all thanks to Jay. Sophia jumped for joy and ran toward the stage. Jay, too, took his time and went that way, looking at the paintings of beautiful modern artists. He used to not understand their style, their language. But one day he decided to attend a sensational lecture that turned his conservative view of art upside down. From then on, he began to visit such exhibitions more often. He liked the concepts themselves, the language of the creators. They expressed their feelings through strange figures or compositions. Many people don't understand contemporary art, but if you think about it, art is feelings, with the help of which the author expresses himself. Is it possible to make feelings accountable to the laws of logic? No, it's impossible. Our feelings are confusion, impulsiveness, chaos. It's an explosion of emotion, a firework, an avalanche, a torrent. That's what real art is. No, that didn't mean that Jay had stopped being fascinated by the classics and only watched modern dramas and read books from this century. Jay still preferred Shakespeare to everything in the world and adored Pushkin. But time marches on. Art and culture acquire completely new colors, and to fit the new time, you have to accept its basic laws, genres. It is in our age that art is free. People express themselves with the help of objects strange at first glance, draw incomprehensible pictures, make sculptures incomprehensible to the masses. But all this really shows what a big step culture has made by the standards of mankind. People are not confined within the limits of their previous existence. They do and create what they want, what they feel. This was Jay's inspiration, and it was in this lecture that he was going to tell everyone about contemporary art and its impact on people. And now let's welcome legendary film critic, literary critic, journalist, author, and of course philanthropist, Mr. J, announced the host. J came on stage with a smile, adjusted his tie, coughed into the microphone and pulled out his papers. There were about 30 pieces of paper. J hoped he would be understood and supported. He was a little apprehensive. The other professors before him had talked about timeless classics, about the importance of preserving history. And now he would break all the foundations and tell everyone the truth, or rather, what he believes is the future of mankind. So, he began confidently. Many of you in this room probably know me as a literary critic as well as an art critic. Well, today I want to talk about art, specifically about its modern direction. There were some sighs and muffled exclamations in the hall. The reactions were quite different. But Jay noticed one pattern. Teenagers, students, the younger generation in general, were mostly excited about the topic, while the older or even older people made faces in anticipation of something disgusting. Of course, Jay was a bit tense about this reaction of the older generation, since they were the ones who were now at the helm. And if Jay said anything wrong, he would be quickly nailed and scrapped. His heartbeat quickened noticeably, but he decided to continue. Modern art is something wonderful, beautiful. It reflects our society, our thoughts, our feelings. It is a broad concept, encompassing various forms of creativity from painting and sculpture to installation and performance. Artists use new materials, techniques and ideas to express their thoughts, emotions. Jay hesitated for a few seconds, but saw a look that glowed with support. Sophia's gaze. It seemed like she was about to go to heaven with pleasure. She was really enjoying Jay's speech. Modern art is just as divisive and controversial because its meanings and purpose are not always clear. With a smile, the man continued. However, that is where its value lies, its ability to provoke dialogue and reflection. Often works of contemporary art offer the viewer new views on the world, evoke emotions and make them think. 
It is important to realize that contemporary art does not have to appeal to everyone. It is meant to evoke different reactions, emotions, and to open new horizons for understanding and perceiving the world. That is why we are here now, in this museum. Here very young talents show what their thoughts and feelings are capable of, what they are capable of. I think it would be useful for all of you to study at least a few paintings, installations, sculptures. Yes, at first glance it may seem to you that this is a complete nonsense, and the creator obviously used something before creating this masterpiece. There were chuckles in the audience. But look closely, he continued, pleased with the first lively reaction. Once you remove your preconceptions about modern art, once you get a sense of what the author of a particular work meant to say, only then will you be able to understand yourself. Jay talked for a long time and finally finished. There was a round of applause at the beginning and then whispers were heard in the hall, quickly turning into loud cheers. I hope that I have helped you a little in giving you a new perspective on contemporary art. Once again, I insist that you examine the works on display in this museum. May each of you discover something new about contemporary art. May we be prepared to reflect on its meaning and impact on our lives. It will definitely be useful for you. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or want to discuss this topic in more detail, I will be happy to help. Once again, a vibrant discussion began in the room about the words we had just heard. Jay really struck a chord with many. Many visitors began to approach the paintings of the sculpture to study them in more detail, rather than superficially. Jay was pleased that many were affected by his words and had a positive reaction. Of course, there were some old people who immediately left the building after the mini-lecture. But that didn't really upset Jay. The main thing was that he had conveyed his thoughts to the masses, and the reporters who filmed all his speeches would probably post it on social media, which would create even more coverage. Jay came down from the stage. He was immediately approached by three girls who asked for his autograph. Of course, he didn't turn them down. He realized that it wasn't every day that you could meet someone who was 15 years older than them, but understood their lives, understood what they lived and what art meant to them. Jay noticed a girl not far away who was looking at a painting. She seemed genuinely interested. She was wearing a light, airy white dress with a wide ribbon around her waist. She looked very graceful. Her crabby ponytail completed this airy look. Jay just couldn't help but approach this thoughtful lady. He approached her very quietly and stood at her side, which made the girl shudder in surprise when she turned her head. Oh, pardon me, please. So unexpected. The mysterious stranger was embarrassed. Jay's smile never left his face. He already thought he looked like a maniac, but he just couldn't take his eyes off this marvelous creature. I'm sorry I startled you, he said. It just seemed to me that you were trying very long and hard to understand this picture. Yes. After listening to your lecture, I really wanted to take a closer look at these colors and strokes. You've inspired me, you might say. Let me explain the meaning of this masterpiece. A masterpiece that simply hasn't been recognized as such yet. I'd be all for it. The girl smiled. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Jay. He extended his manly hand to the fragile angel. The girl was embarrassed and hid her smile behind the book he was clutching to his chest. Lisa. The stranger finally introduced herself and shook his hand lightly. What have you got there, Jane Austen? Jay asked, looking at the book Lisa held in her hands. Yes, I like novels like that. Romance, but at the same time very deep philosophy. It's all about knowing where to dig. Well, commendable, smiled the man. But let's get back to the painting. This picture was painted by a rather famous artist named Jenny. Initially, you must have completely missed the meaning of those gray blotches and colors. The painting is serial and is known for its gray shades and abstract style. It creates a feeling of haziness and mystery. You can see different shades of gray in this painting that create a sense of depth and mystery. When you look at this, it creates some overwhelming sense of unease. I think gray shades can symbolize uncertainty, melancholy, or longing. But everyone can perceive this painting in their own way depending on their own associations and emotional state. Is that what you feel when you look at it? Me? Lisa was surprised. Well, I get very uncomfortable. It feels like the author was depressed at the time he painted this picture, and deeply depressed. 
although I do find something in common with her emotional state. I think I even understand her. That red color. The girl pointed to the right corner. It is a kind of anger, and all the gray colors represent a depressive state. So it's like the artist rarely has any emotions. Everything is gray, lifeless. Perhaps this life has become so ordinary for her that she has become unbearably bored. I'm amazed at you, Jay marveled. It's the first time I've seen someone describe a painting in such detail, based on both his own feelings and those of the author. Really? I thought everyone did that. You gave me a whole lecture yourself. A little grinned Lisa. I like you more and more, Jay confessed aloud, and almost collapsed on the floor with embarrassment. He hadn't meant to say that out loud. He noticed Lisa's embarrassment, too. She hadn't expected that from a stranger, either. Well, it was nice to meet you. Jay tried to end the conversation as quickly as possible. Maybe I'll see you at some of the shows, though I don't go to them that often. Today was the only one I've been to in six months. I look forward to seeing you again. You are a very interesting person, Lisa admitted, shook hands with the man and left for another hall. They never crossed paths again. A month passed. This meeting has completely slipped Jay's mind. He had already forgotten their long conversation. But now he was invited to the exhibition again, but as an ordinary guest, although with some additional opportunities. For example, he could enter the halls where other visitors were not allowed. Jay decided to go there with his family. They rarely went out, and this was a great chance to spend time together. The only one who couldn't join was Hannah. She went on sick leave when her boyfriend passed his illness on to her as well. I'm sorry, sweetie. Feel better, Jay said into the phone receiver and dropped the call. It was a shame, but there was nothing to be done. Health was always more important. Diana and her husband came to the meeting. Everyone was in formal suits, so handsome and businesslike. Diana had made her hair dazzling. So many visitors turned around to get a closer look at this beauty. This time the exhibition was held in one of the historic houses in their region. Jay even joked that it was a pity he didn't have a companion to dance at the ball in the former aristocratic assembly. Of course, there was no ball here now. They don't have balls these days. Like last time, everyone came to see paintings by modern artists. It's a very strange piece of work, don't you think? Diana asked her father coming up behind him. She took another sip of champagne and waited for his answer. Life is so inconceivable sometimes. Like, only a month ago praising modern artists who brought something completely new to our world. But seeing this honestly makes me want to cry. What was he trying to say with those cakes? It was a very strange sculpture indeed. Glued to the mirror were three donuts with different colored icing, white, black, pink. Each one had teeth marks on it. One had had the edge bitten off. Nothing else had been made or written here. Jay completely failed to understand the meaning of this masterpiece. Oh. I see you too like my installation. I'm very flattered, because I spent a whole month developing this idea," said the thin young man, whose gait was more like a lady's. A month? Diana shouted in surprise, and she immediately closed her mouth, seeing the artist's displeased look. Yes, a month. He repeated hoctily. Let me show you. He carelessly pushed Jay and Diana aside, and stood as close to that mirror as possible. Now. He began. This installation is called Stop Eating. Jay and Deanna looked at each other. They were trying hard not to laugh, but their smiles were definitely becoming clearly visible. Let me ask you something, Jay said, holding back a laugh. Why did you choose such a vulgar name? Oh, it makes an impression and makes you act. But then again, he's thinking. Don't distract me. Now where was I? Oh yes, my concept. It's simpler than it sounds. It's a protest against the toxic consumption of junk food. He was silent, as if waiting for a reaction. But the audience didn't react. Jay had no idea what the man was talking about. Excuse me, what toxic consumption? The professor asked. Why are you people so shallow? All right, I'll explain it to you on my fingers. So, let's start with the fact that our century is the century of consumption. People buy goods, food, really, absolutely everything. And then they throw it all in the trash, polluting our nature and ecology. People today are really selfish, but that's not the point at all. I decided to look at the statistics of obesity in the world and was simply horrified when I saw the figures. 33% of the planet is now overweight, 
and if this is not stopped, the numbers will only increase. So how does your installation combat this problem? Diana asked, draining her glass of champagne. How? You what? Donuts represent fat. Insanity. Sweets are addictive. To lose weight, you have to stop eating those sweets. But people decide what weight they're comfortable living at. No? Oh, come on. The creator exploded. The more people like that eat buns, the more they consume. Basically, it's all bad for our environment. But how does your painting help to combat this problem? Jay asked. People will look at it and realize what a terrible mistake they are making. They will realize when they look first at the donuts and then in the mirror. But let me ask you, how are they going to realize it when even you've been explaining this installation to us for 15 minutes? Why don't you write an explanatory note here, leave some guidelines? Yes? Jay had already begun to mock the poor young man, but he was not offended, but rather angry. It seemed he was about to turn around and smash the damn mirror to smithereens. It soon became clear that he really wanted to do that, for he had already taken a swing. Jay and Diana rushed to stop the unhappy artist, but a girl Jay hadn't expected to be here came to the rescue. It was Lisa. Robert! She shouted and took the crazy man by the arm. Calm down, Robert. Calm down. The words really seemed to have an effect on him. He, breathing heavily, stepped away from his masterpiece, spinning his eyes frantically. What's wrong? What are you doing? asked him sternly Lisa. These two insulted my work, he cried. Jay certainly didn't think artists were so sentimental. He felt very ashamed. He was more ashamed of the crazy man. We didn't do anything like that. Diana was indignant, stomping on her heel. We were just talking, and he, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, acted like a child. What kind of circus am I in? Lisa, do you two know each other? Jay was surprised. Yes, this is a good friend of mine, replied the embarrassed girl. Dad. Lisa. Who? Who is this? Diana whispered angrily into her father's ear. He blushed more and more but did not lose his mind. Yes, this is Lisa. He introduced his acquaintance. We met her at an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art about a month ago. Lisa. Please meet Lisa. This is my daughter Diana. He addressed the girl. Diana had nothing to do but smile and shake his hand. I am very glad to hear that my father has an acquaintance who also loves art. A peer of mine, she added casually, but everyone took the hint. Jay gave Diana an angry look, then walked over to Lisa. I apologize, he turned to Robert. I shouldn't have tortured you like that. We were only curious. We didn't mean to hurt you. The young man gave Jay a haughty look and then walked away, catching his shoulder. On purpose. I apologize for making such a circus, he said to Lisa. She smiled embarrassedly, then said, It's good to see you again. I didn't expect to meet you again, and again at such an interesting exhibition. Oh yes, laughed Jay. I'm here with my family. He looked around to show Diana and Ray, but they had disappeared somewhere. He just shrugged it and went back to his dialogue with this lovely girl. What do you think of Mona Lisa? Jay asked it as they walked slowly through the house. I think this painting is overrated. It's a masterpiece, no doubt. But there's nothing unusual about that smile. You see, people are always trying to find a clue when there's no clue. They're looking for a miracle in ordinary things for some reason. But I think da Vinci is a genius after all. You see, it's not her smile that's the mystery. It's the look in her eyes. Leonardo, I think, was the first person who could make a smile with his eyes, not his lips. It's like he put his soul into it. Those eyes seemed to glow. I didn't expect to hear you speak like that. I was very surprised. And the best part is, I think exactly the same thing. You're so smart. Let me ask you an indiscreet question. How old are you? I'm 26. Lisa answered with a smile. That answer didn't embarrass Jay in the least. He expected something like that. Lisa was very young, but she thought like a very wise person who had seen a lot of things. It seemed unbelievable. Look at them, Diana whispered to her husband. They were standing in a remote corner of the hall, watching everyone like maniacs. Diana stood businesslike, but already more relaxed. The alcohol had finally taken its toll on her, but she continued to drink that delicious champagne. What are they discussing now? Not the mysteries of art or the meaning of life, I don't think. 
she said snidely. Well, do you want to come closer? Let's have a look, Ray replied. Diana looked at him indignantly. Ray, are you stupid or what? What closer? But you wanted it, didn't you? God, I'm just speaking figuratively. Diana was angry. I don't like this. And Lisa is too weak and obviously looks at people superficially. You know? I know bitches like that. Well, such a pretty girl cannot understand art. She just wants to make some money. So she thinks about where to put her pretty face. And the plaster. So much plaster. How come her whole face hasn't fallen off? It's a disgrace. Why are you being so mean to her? You don't even know her. Ray replied. Maybe this girl is really interested in paintings. Maybe she's an artist herself. You don't know. There's no need to know. Diana rolled her eyes, then gently pointed her finger at the girl with white hair. She was dressed in strange clothes. Everything seemed to be made of leaves, and on her head were intertwined tree branches. It was as if she was nature in a human body. There, see? That's really an artist. That's a really creative person. Now look at this. See? Skin and bones. I bet she's anorexic, too. Maybe you're just jealous, Ray remarked. I don't see anything wrong with that girl. Jealous? Ray, are you out of your depth? She turned away from her husband and turned her attention back to watching Jay and Lisa. They were looking at some large painting on the entire wall. Diana nervously twirled the glass in her hands. She certainly didn't like what she was seeing. What if she wants my father's money? Diana drew a terrible conclusion. Exactly. She wants to seduce him and then take all the inheritance. She's a con artist. I'm going to go and bring her to justice right away. Ray didn't have time to stop his wife. She ran toward Jay and Lisa at the speed of light. As soon as she reached them, she yanked the poor girl by the shoulder. She gasped in surprise. Her eyes were filled with indignation and fear. Excuse me, said Lisa. I will not forgive. Get away from my father, shouted Diana. What? Lisa was outraged, raising her voice. How dare you? And Lisa pushed Diana, from which she staggered and could not keep her balance because of the amount of alcohol she drank. She collapsed, and something crunched under her. Then there was the sound of breaking glass. Diana looked at her hand. It was covered in blood. There were shards of glass on the floor. Her palm was literally pressed into the shards, but she felt no pain. Oh my God! Someone screamed from behind her. It was a woman's voice. Slowly people began to gather around Diana, but the girl wasn't going to stop. She was so under the influence of anger that she threw herself at Lisa. They both collapsed to the floor and began to struggle. Jay tried to pull the fighting girls apart, but it was pointless. Nails and glass shards were used. Then Diana grabbed Lisa's hair and pulled it, causing her rival to scream in pain. Somebody stop this. Security. People were yelling. Two pumped-up men in black uniforms arrived only a few minutes later. They were able to pull the two Furies apart. Diana was held by Jay, and Lisa, who was almost unconscious, was supported by a guard. Lisa's entire throat was scratched. Somewhere shards were even digging into her delicate skin. As soon as Jay saw this, he immediately dropped Diana and ran up to Lisa. Ray grabbed Diana and started to calm her down, but she wasn't fighting anymore. Get an ambulance! Call an ambulance, Jay shouted, examining Lisa's neck. A few minutes later, the poor girl was taken to the hospital. All the guests saw her off, standing on the porch with a plaid blanket. It was already getting colder, so it was impossible to stand outside for long. Jay sighed heavily and walked back into the building. There, the police officers were questioning Diana. Ray stood beside her, saying that she was in no condition to say anything. She was drunk. Jay was ashamed and disgusted to even go near his daughter. He walked through the debris and saw some woman sitting on her knees crying. It seemed to be the same place where Diana had fallen. What's your emergency? Jay leaned sympathetically toward the poor woman. She looked at him with tear-stained eyes. My sculpture. Sculpture? I've been making it for two years. The woman sobbed. Jay could see why the devastation had caused such a reaction in the woman. It was her creation, and now it was bound to be ruined. Barbarically destroyed. The artist screamed, clutching a shard of her sculpture in her hands. Jay sat down next to her. May I ask what it was? Jay asked carefully. I was making a meaningful copy of David. I just added my own details to it, 
change the image a little. But there's no point in talking about it now. It's all gone. It hurts like hell. I understand. It was Jay. You know, I'm an art historian by trade. I'm often invited to see how really old things are restored. It could be dishes, sculptures, books. And then one day, the restoration department burned down. You may have heard about it on the news. A lot of things were saved, but I had one favorite book, and I loved to look at the cover of it, even though I didn't even know the content or the author. So, when everything in that department burned down, I went to identify some items and saw that very cover on the floor. All the pages of that book had burned, but my cover was still there. You see, I wasn't allowed to take it with me, but they promised that they would display it in the museum. What's my point? Even an artifact that has lost its historical value can be important to us. Something will definitely be left of it. And even if this cover burned, I wouldn't grieve, because I still have the memory of it. I put a part of my soul into it, even though I was not even the creator. The woman listened to him very carefully and seemed to understand what he was saying. She gripped the shard of her sculpture even tighter. Keep this piece, Jay said. It will remind you of your labor, of the feelings you had when you created it. Yes, your personal David may be lost, but you still have your most precious possessions, feelings, memories, and emotions. Isn't that the point of art, to leave something in your soul? some notch on your memory. But no one else will ever see it. I'm sure you didn't originally set out to impress anyone. You were doing it for yourself first. You wanted to pour your feelings out somewhere, and that's where your art has served you well. Even in this shard, your energy remains. God, the woman whispered, please tell me your name. Jay grinned. My name is Jay. He confessed. Jay, the woman continued to whisper. You just opened my eyes. I feel no pain at all, even though five minutes ago I wanted to kill myself. Wouldn't you like to be a psychologist? No. My calling is art. The artist cried and threw herself into his arms. He smiled, stroked her back and soothed her, soothed her as best he could, and he seemed to be succeeding. After half an hour, the police realized they weren't going to get anything out of Diana, so they released her and her husband. Ray shook Jay's hand and promised to take Diana home safely. Jay had no doubt that he would. It was Ray. Although he still couldn't keep track of her today, Jay approached the staff. They gave him a leering look, then asked, Are you a witness? Yes. I'm the father of the girl who caused all this commotion. Can you tell me more about what happened? The cameras don't explain much, the woman in the uniform asked. Well, that's going to be a little difficult, but I'll give it a shot. The thing is, my daughter didn't like the woman I was talking to. Although I think it was the alcohol. Diana always does terrible things under the influence of alcohol. Why would she drink so much of it? She needed a distraction. Apparently her husband didn't keep track of how much she was drinking. It was a terrible situation. My friend Lisa is now in the hospital. The evening ruined things with this girl too, it seems. Are you aware that you will now have to sue that lady over there? The policewoman asked the woman. Jay followed his gaze to her hand and saw the very woman he had been calming down a few minutes ago. She was looking at him with a smile. I think we can settle this without a trial, Jay summarized, smiling. Well, we hope so too. You're better off. But you'll still have to pay moral indemnity to all the guests tonight. No problem. How much? The officer looked a little puzzled at the question. She obviously didn't expect Jay to offer money right away. They'll find out later, the woman explained. You're free for the day. Thanks for the information. Do you need a ride? No. Thank you. I drove my car here. It's okay. They said their goodbyes, and Jay walked out of the building. The car was parked nearby. But the man had to walk through the entire park before reaching his transportation. He had planned to go home first, to get some rest. This evening clearly didn't go according to plan. Jay hadn't expected to see Lisa there either, and certainly hadn't thought events would unfold this way. He started the car, but he wasn't going to his house. His destination now was the city hospital. That's where the ambulance had taken the unfortunate Lisa. Good evening. Could you tell me, please, what room is Lisa in? Just Lisa. He smiled at the young woman at the information desk. Jay realized only now that he didn't know her last name or her first name. Lisa, who? 
Give me the last name, a tired, monotone voice said. This shift had obviously been very hard on her. Honestly, I don't remember the last name. It's a friend of mine. I just wanted to know if she was okay. Sorry, no strangers allowed. Jay smiled sadly and stepped aside. He decided to wait a while. What if Lisa came out here? At least Jay hoped so. But half an hour passed. An hour. No one came out. Only the nurse behind the counter eyed him suspiciously. Soon Jay got tired. It was already eleven o'clock in the evening. He realized that no Lisa was coming out. He wished the nurse on duty a good night and left the hospital. As he passed through the gate, he saw a poor grandmother begging for alms. Of course, Jay had a very kind heart and a huge soul, so he handed her a large denomination bill. Granny's eyes went to her forehead. All day long she had collected several dollars in that plastic cup, and now she was being handed a hundred-dollar bill. Jay was about to leave, but Grandma called out to him. My son! she shouted, barely catching up with him, and handed him the money back. Jay looked at her with total incomprehension. Honey, I don't need that kind of money. What if I get mugged? Thank you, but it's too much. Grandma, please take it. I'm not forcing you to do anything. I just wanted to help you. Jay answered. But the old woman just shook her head from side to side. She probably wanted to take the bill and spend the money, but it was as if something was stopping her. Was it moral principles or fear for her life? It didn't matter. The bottom line was the same. The poor grandmother returned the money. Then Jay found a solution to the problem. He pulled a wallet from his pocket and took out some bills from there. They were of lesser value. He handed the old lady forty dollars in small bills. Here. Please don't refuse at least this. Now the grandmother did not have to be persuaded for a long time. She took the money and immediately hid it in a secret pocket of her skirt. Gratitude shone in her eyes. Then she crossed Jay. God bless you, honey. God give you happiness, she exclaimed. Tears of joy flowed from her eyes. Can I give you a ride? I've got a car nearby. No, thanks, honey. There are kind people here, too. The orderlies let me sleep in their back room. Sometimes I help them with the cleaning. I say my prayers at the hospital church for health. I'll say one for you too, dear. There is mercy in this world after all. She mumbled and crossed herself for a long time, but he was already gone. Jay smiled as he headed for the car. He was very thoughtful. He was very concerned about Lisa's condition. He hadn't even seen her. And the last thing he saw was her horribly mangled neck. He hoped that the girl was okay and would recover. Jay was terribly angry with his daughter. Diana had been very reckless, childish. She wasn't even a teenager, but she'd done something so stupid. She's done so much damage to people. The poor woman who had her sculpture broken. People who couldn't enjoy that beautiful evening surrounded by paintings and works of art. What if someone had a date there and now it was irrevocably ruined? Diana could ruin someone's fate. She could cause irreparable injury to Lisa. She could turn the wrong way. And then what? The doctors had to help her, and the glass shards in her head and neck. Jay even had the thought of turning around and going to his daughter's house to have a serious talk with her. He seriously considered suing her. But then he remembered that this was his daughter. Whatever she is, she's his own blood. He has to protect her, even when she commits such horrors. Jay didn't understand what it was that Diana disliked it so much. Why had she decided to lash out at poor Lisa? After all, they hadn't even really met, just shook hands. That was the end of their acquaintance. Why is Diana so angry? She's always been reasonable. She did the right thing. Something strange happened to her today. She can't have any more alcohol. Jay decided to talk to Ray about it when he visited them again, if Diana would be able to have her father over. She'd probably be embarrassed after all. At least he hoped so. But all his hopes were in vain. The next day, after a terrible hangover, Diana sat in the kitchen and drank water in glasses. When is this hedeki going to go away? She moaned. She had been suffering from a hedeki all morning, which was accompanied by a buzzing in her legs and arms. There were many bruises on her body. That's a lesson for you, Ray quietly remarked. He was clearly annoyed. His wife's behavior had affected his reputation a lot. Or rather, it would. The news would be written about it and his colleagues would create rumors of their own. He'll definitely lose his bonus. What's the lesson, Ray? Diana whimpered, putting a piece of ice in gauze to her temple. 
I'm not 17 years old to have life giving me lessons. No, but you see yourself as exactly 17. Although even teenagers don't stoop to that. Like what? I just took it off my dad's shoulder. Didn't you see her making a move on him? Ray couldn't take it anymore and pounded his fist on the table, causing the cutlery to fly upward. Diana immediately stopped talking and held her breath. She was feeling real fear now. She really felt like a teenager being reprimanded by her father. I spent half an hour trying to prove to the police that you were under the influence of alcohol. And now you're claiming it was all deliberate? Why are you so aggressive, Diane? Why are you so violent? Violent? The girl was indignant. Yes, Diana, violent. You attacked a poor defenseless girl at a cultural event. You put splinters in her neck. You don't think that's cruel? Okay, I admit it. There's a lot I don't remember. I may have done some things unconsciously drunk, but I was motivated by my brain, not alcohol. I knew what I was doing. Did you want to kill her? I don't understand, shouted Ray. No, just to teach her a lesson. Let her know who she's messing with. She's not worthy of my father. Jesus, Diana, the boy screamed. Do you hear yourself? How do you even know she wants money from your father? God, I am so shocked at you. They were just discussing the exhibit, that's all. He told me himself he was seeing her for the second time in his life. Ray, don't you get it? Me? No? I don't need your explanations. There's no excuse for what you did. It was just awful. I've never seen you like that in my life. I don't think I've ever known you. You see, you're lucky. You've never seen me angry. Isn't that wonderful? Ray didn't answer anything. He just looked at his wife with a detached and disappointed look but then he grabbed his coat and left the house. Ray, where are you going? Diana shouted after him, trying to catch up with him, but the guy had already called the elevator and left. He wanted to be alone, or rather, he wanted to discuss last night's situation with a more sensible person. Jay, are you home today? I wanted to stop by, Ray said into the phone while he was driving. He was on his way to Jay's house because he knew that the man was always home on this day. He was either working or taking a vacation from the weekdays. Hey, Ray. No, not home today. Sorry. Things came up. Jay answered. Business? What kind of stuff? There was a momentary silence, and then Jay confessed. Come to the city hospital. I'm here. Then the man hung up. Ray was very surprised by this turn of events and stopped the car right on the highway. Three cars honked at him from behind and one driver shouted a profanity-laced word out the window. Ray took a moment to catch his breath, then turned around and drove back into town. Hello, Mr. J. Ray said hello as he flew into the waiting room. J even jumped with surprise. He was quietly reading a magazine, like everyone else in the room. Just then, Ray burst in. Hi, Ray. J smiled. Have a seat. Ray sat down next to him without a second thought and waited to see what J would say. But the man didn't say anything. He continued reading his magazine. Jay, who are we waiting for? The boy asked uncertainly. Jay looked at his son-in-law with a nonchalant face. Then he took a deep breath and exhaled. We're waiting for Lisa. She should be here any minute. Lisa? Oh yeah, you didn't. Well, that's the girl your wife beat up. She's also my daughter. Unfortunately. Ray blushed. He even had a fleeting thought of getting out of here before it was too late. He didn't want to face the man who'd been lying on the floor yesterday with a shredded neck, but there was no time to escape. A young blonde woman in a white coat appeared in the doorway. She looked haggard. You could see bruises under her eyes with the naked eye. Her whole face was swollen and her neck was bandaged, making her look like a robot because she couldn't turn her head. However, when she spotted Jay, a smile appeared on her face. She hurried toward him as fast as she could, even though she could barely get her feet over his feet. It seemed as if she was about to trip and fall, but all was well, and Lisa reached them safely. Jay had so many thoughts running through his head. There was so much he wanted to say to this angel, but everything immediately slipped his mind. Emptiness. He felt uncomfortable with the silence, but it was like his tongue wouldn't listen. Jay just stood there staring at the pretty girl. She extended her hand to the man, but he continued to stare at her. Ray even waved his hand in front of his eyes to get him out of his trance. But the man wouldn't come to his senses. Suddenly a ray of sunlight hit him in the eye, and Jay woke up. He immediately noticed the girl's hand, her confused look. 
Instead of shaking her palm, he reached for the flowers. Ray wondered, where had they come from? There hadn't been any flowers when he'd come in. Mr. J, are you a magician? Jay held out the beautiful bouquet of soft pink roses to Lisa with a pleased expression. She gratefully accepted the gift and set it aside on the coffee table. Now they were standing like two inept teenagers again, staring at each other without saying a word. I'm Ray. The boy decided to intervene. He shook Lisa's hand and looked away embarrassed. I'm Diana's husband. I want to apologize for my wife's behavior. It was a terrible situation. I still feel bad about it. Lisa was smiling. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you came to see me, said the girl, turning to Ray. How are you feeling? Jay intervened in the dialogue. I had surgery yesterday. It wasn't that complicated, but I had to go under general anesthesia. She made a sorrowful face. The doctor took a lot of shrapnel out of my neck. But I should be out of here in a week. I'm sorry you're looking at my swollen face right now. Unfortunately, IV fluids have a big effect on our appearance. She laughed a little. I'm glad you're in a good mood, Jay remarked. I hope you feel better soon. Yes. There was an awkward pause. Jay realized that Lisa wasn't going to say anything else, so he took Ray's hand as if he were his own son, put a smile on his face and said to the girl, Well, let's head for the exit. If you don't mind, I'll visit you a few more times. Of course I'd be glad to, Lisa replied. Sorry for such an awkward question. What kind of candy do you like? The girl blushed even more, and then answered, I won't say. Have a good day. Jay was a little disappointed by this answer, but he decided to leave the poor girl alone. He wished her the best of luck a few more times. Then he and Ray left the hospital. Jay immediately lit a cigarette. Is there any more? Ray asked, hoping to get rid of the stress too. You're still young. Take care of your health, Jay answered. They walked slowly to the parking lot. Why are you so concerned about Lisa's condition? Ray asked. What do you mean? Jay was surprised. He even stopped, finished his cigarette, threw it away, and then said with a sigh, So you're that indifferent to other people? You don't care about the fate of another person? Your wife caused Lisa the kind of damage she'll live with for the rest of her life. The scars from those shards will scar her forever. And you don't care? No, of course not. That's why I came here, isn't it? Ray answered uncertainly. Why? Diana scares me. She said she did it on purpose. I want to confess to you. She thinks this Lisa has bad intentions for you. What do you mean? Well, she wants to be a kept woman and live off you. And to be honest, when I saw her, Diana's words popped into my heed, and I even believed them. Jay looked up at the sky. The sun was no longer warming, and fall leaves were falling from the trees. Winter was coming. A snowball was about to fly from the sky. Jay loved this time of year. He basically loved watching nature, the changing of the seasons. It took him away from his problems, away from unnecessary thoughts, gave him a reset, a different perspective. What does she care about my love life? Jay finally answered. Ray was very surprised. What do you mean? She's your daughter, worried about you and her inheritance. Ray thought for a moment. He thought of ways to justify his wife, but he couldn't find the words. I'll forgive her, Jay said, but keep her out of my personal affairs. Tell her she's not coming to any more business meetings with me. Thank you, Mr. J, said Ray. They had already approached his car, so the guy had already gone to his driver's seat and started the car. I respect this case, Ray. Don't let Diane worry. Just remind her that everything you have now was achieved not only by her labor, but in most cases she had help from me. That car you drive now was a gift to you. This apartment you love my daughter in. Ray blushed terribly. He wanted to go underground and never come back out into the world. Okay, Mr. J. He stretched, not looking the man in the eye. Then he just got into the car and slammed the door shut. Through the glass he heard Jay's voice. I'll call you tonight, there's something we need to talk about. And Ray drove off in a pensive mood. He was confused and tense. After all, Diana was right. This Lisa wants to round his head, and he, like a mouse, is walking into a mouse trap to certain death. In the evening, the phone call actually rang. Ray was sure that Jay was going to call Diane, but that's not what happened. They were watching TV together when suddenly Ray's cell phone rang. Who's calling you? Diane asked with some tension. Work. Ray answered quickly and went into the other room. 
He became very nervous when he saw Jay's name on the phone screen. Mr. Jay? Unsurely, the guy answered. He glanced at the door and sensed that Diane was eavesdropping, so he moved to the other end of the room and began to speak in a whisper. Yeah, Ray. Hi. I'm calling you with a proposition. I decided to leave Diana out of it for now so the subject wouldn't come up again. So, my mom's anniversary's coming up. Her grandmother's. Yeah. When is it? A month from now? December 21st. That's a Sunday. Well, that's it. Will you and Diana come, please? Of course, it's her grandmother. Oh, great. I'll send you two weeks' notice. Why did you call me and not Diane? I think she'd be happy to hear the news. I told you, she's not ready to have this conversation. When I was a kid, she resented me for a week for pointing out her mistake. I guess nothing's changed. Let her live like that. Don't even mention the anniversary yet. She'll find out when the time comes. Okay, Mr. J. And that's when Diana walked into the room. My doubts were confirmed. She was definitely eavesdropping. But Ray was quick to recognize it. Okay, Mr. J. He said, confidently assuming a businesslike demeanor. You got it. I got it. And he dropped the call, exhaling discreetly. Diana approached him like a sly fox and immediately asked, Who called you? The boss. He told me to bring a file to work tomorrow. I see. Diana reacted disinterestedly and immediately slipped into the other room. In the days that followed, Jay was determined to give Lisa the best care possible. First, he paid her moral compensation, and then he persuaded the management to move her to a private room. They hadn't met since the day Jay first saw her in the hospital. His lawyer did everything, but three days later, Jay decided to visit Lisa in person. Hello? He peeked through the crack of the room door. May I come in? A woman's sleepy voice answered in the affirmative. Jay entered the room. It turned out that Lisa had just recently woken up. He saw something that looked like porridge from the gray hospital plate. The girl was very surprised by the unexpected arrival of the professor. She even perked up and tried to fix her hair. Good, good morning, she answered embarrassedly. I'm sorry, I didn't think you'd come, so... Don't apologize, Jay replied, slowly entering the room. I brought you some tangerines and oranges. I hope you're not allergic to citrus fruits. No, Lisa smiled. I'm very glad you came to see me, and in general I'm glad that you did for me. Lisa, can we go back to being on a first-name basis? Yes, of course, I'm just, you know, I'm already quite an adult, an experienced person. You are. Oh, you, of course, too, but you still have your whole life ahead of you. You know, it's hard for me to say this right now, and maybe you won't understand me right away. Lisa watched with terrible interest. Jay knew how to intrigue. I just feel like an inexperienced teenager right now. It's just you. Would you like to go on a date with me? And Lisa pulled away. Jay could even read the fear in her eyes. Or was it a spark of desire? Jay still didn't know. Jay. Yay. I'm sorry. I guess. I guess I was rushing. He backed up. We don't even know each other. Yeah. Jay had his head down in despair. He wanted to run away. But Lisa suddenly continued her thought. Yes. We don't know each other very well. But are friends supposed to come on a date? I think that's what dates are for, to get to know each other, don't you? Jay blossomed immediately. His face seemed to come alive. He moved closer to Lisa and said, Then next week I'll take you to an amazing place. You'll love it. I guarantee it. I trust professionals. And yes, we're on a first-name basis, the girl said with a smile. Oh yes, it's very unusual. Jay resented it. Well, I'll see you Monday. I'll pick you up. From here? The girl marveled. The man smiled slyly and left the room. A week later, Jay arrived at the same place and entered the same room. Good afternoon. How are you? The man had not warned the girl in advance about the meeting, but he knew that this very day on Monday she would be discharged. She sat in the room on her suitcases and waited for the doctor to bring her papers. Mr. Jay, she shouted. Just Jay, smiled the man walking into the room. He was already in a formal suit except he didn't bring flowers. But I'm not ready, the girl replied sadly. My face is swollen and my neck looks terrible. After all, the cream that the doctor prescribed will work, God willing, in a month. You won't need a face. Jay smiled. Then he realized that sounded strange, and he decided to correct himself. The place we're going doesn't require it. Well, you'll see when we get there. 
and Lisa was terribly intrigued. Finally, they gave her the discharge and she was free to go. They walked to the car, and Jay opened the trunk. He pulled out a huge bouquet of red roses and a box of gift-wrapped chocolates and handed them to the girl. She was amazed at the gesture. Thank you, she stammered. Now let's go, Jay said. They both got into the car and drove off. The drive took only 20 minutes, and soon they were there. Lisa saw a two-story gray, unremarkable building. She was even a little disappointed. Had Jay decided to bring her to some factory? But upon entering, she realized it was definitely not a factory. The receptionist gave them carnival masks. These were what visitors were supposed to wear throughout the adventure. Adventures? Lisa clarified. Yes, we are going on a real adventure. Jay confirmed and put on the mask. They entered a spacious hall. At first it was completely white. There were only a few visitors. But after a few minutes, a miracle happened. A blue beam of light flashed on the ceiling. Then it spread all over the walls of the hall. It was so spectacular, it took your breath away. And then Lisa recognized in this picturesque performance a painting by Van Gogh, Starry Night. The girl was simply amazed. She had never seen anything like it in her life, and Jay stared unabashedly into her dazzling eyes, which finally in the last few days shone with happiness. They moved on to another hall. In this hall a field of sunflowers could be seen right on the floor. One could smell them, smell the wind blowing. It turned out that all the halls in this exhibition were dedicated to Van Gogh. In each hall there was something unusual connected with his paintings. In the last hall, they lay on the soft bed-like floor and looked up at the ceiling. This hall represented the painting Starry Night above the area. It was something very impressive. And not just because there was a soft floor. It was as if this painting had come to life. Jay cried with an excess of emotion. He had never experienced anything like this in his life. Lisa seemed to be left feeling the same way. And as they looked at each other, it was as if a spark flew between them. Lisa reached for Jay first, and he didn't hesitate and kissed her on the lips. It was the most romantic evening of their lives. It was from that day that they started dating. You decided what? Marveled Ray, who was sitting in a nearby chair by the fireplace. Ray arrived at Jay's house to pick up the paperwork, but Jay couldn't help himself and told his son-in-law everything. Don't tell anybody. I want to announce it myself at our family dinner, Jay explained. On your mother's anniversary? Ray couldn't contain his surprise. He was in a terrible state of shock at the news he had just heard. Ray, Jay began, I trust you more than anyone in the world. You've really always seemed like a responsible and reliable person to me so I trusted you with this secret. Yes, I do love Lisa terribly, but you've only known her for a month. You can't fall in love just like that. Son, you're still young. Jay grinned. Pour yourself a cognac. But when you have less and less time, you cling to the slightest sympathy. You see, love can be nurtured. It can be grown out of mere sympathy. The main thing is to know how to do it. You really don't know her at all. What if she's not who she says she is? What if you're making a terrible mistake? Okay, alarmist. Stop scaring and panicking. I'm sure of my choice and I'll announce it soon. Jay finished. He took a sip of cognac and then concluded, I think that's the end of it. Thanks for the interesting conversation. Ray made several more attempts to reason with Jay, but all of them were unsuccessful. The guy didn't understand why his father-in-law was doing this. What is it about this girl? Is she really that special? No, of course not. Ray did not communicate with her, but Diana's words sounded in his head every time he saw Lisa. She was now living at Jay's house and had walked past the living room where they were talking three times. She was smiling, but that smile seemed somehow fake, artificial. Maybe Ray was really paranoid, maybe he was under the influence of his wife, but there was something wrong. A decent girl couldn't just move into the house of a man she didn't even know, who was twice her age. And such a pretty girl, too. Now Ray was almost certain that Diana was right, and Lisa obviously wanted something from Jay. There was a reason she'd taken up residence in his house. But it's the proposal message. It made Ray terribly upset, like they'd lost this battle before the battle had even begun, even though he didn't even want any part of it. Diana had started the whole thing, and she seemed to be right about everything. Diana picked up two postcards from the floor. 
Someone had slipped them through the front door. They were red, with a gold ribbon. The girl immediately recognized her father's handwriting. He loved those colors. They hadn't spoken for a month. And Diana was terribly worried about his condition. Ray, we've got an invitation from Dad, she shouted across the apartment. The boy quickly ran up to his wife and they printed out the letters. My dear children, I invite you to your grandmother's anniversary. There will be a banquet, a family evening, coziness, all the things we love so much. Be sure to bring your other halves. Everyone's welcome. We'll sit together as a family, talk to each other. We don't get to do that very often. P.S. I have some exciting news for you. After reading it, Diane almost exploded with excitement. She missed her father so much. At last their relationship could be saved. This anniversary was the perfect chance. Ray thought differently. He realized that as soon as Diana heard the news, she would simply burst with anger and stop communicating with her father forever. The situation seemed hopeless. But Ray tried to do something about it. Listen, what date is this event? The boy doubted. I think it's the 21st. Why? Diana asked. Honey, but we have a 21st trip to the theater. What theater? The girl became agitated. It was a surprise. I didn't tell you. Did you really buy theater tickets for once? Jesus! Diana almost squealed with joy. But, what about Dad? He'll be terribly offended. No, we'll have to cancel the tickets. I wouldn't do that to my father. Honey, but I wanted to surprise us. Ray lied to the last minute. But Diane wouldn't go along with anything. She felt a terrible guilt towards her father and wanted to atone for it tonight. Ray just accepted the circumstance and went with the flow. Whatever happens. Honey, are you really going to give us the most lavish wedding ever? Lisa smirked, sitting on Jay's lap. He was delighted by her angelic beauty and, of course, nodded as if mesmerized. Well, of course, darling. I'll make you the happiest you've ever been. You won't have to work anymore. But now, to earn the money for our wedding, I have to work a little harder. So, if you'd be so kind, could you take Fred for a walk? Fred? Lisa replied in disgust. He can't be walked by our servant? First of all, Peter is not our servant. Oh, darling. He's my employee, helping me around the house. It's not his job to walk the dogs. And old Freddy likes to go out with someone who's willing to play with him. Lisa was reluctant at first, but then she agreed. She always tried to honor her man's requests, even though she didn't always like them. Jay went to his office, and Lisa reluctantly went to call the dog. Fred! She shouted through the house. Fred! Finally, the dog responded and approached the new man. Finally! Can't wait for you! But as Fred approached her, she bent down to put the collar on him. He licked her face in appreciation. Lisa cried out in fright and disgust. She was horribly disgusted, starting to feel nauseous. It seemed that she was about to vomit. Peter came running in. Lisa, is something wrong? He asked it excitedly. Yes. Lisa screamed hysterically. To walk that dog who ruined all my makeup. And she kicked poor Fred with her foot. The dog was not used to violence, so he did not even dodge, because he was sure that the man would not hurt him. He whimpered resentfully, and Lisa went to the bathroom with an angry face to wash off the nasty drool of the dog. Disgusting dog, she shouted one last time. Peter had to walk the poor dog in her place. Fred was very offended and didn't want to play at anything. When they got home, they were met in the hallway by Jay, who was very surprised to see them. Peter, what are you doing here? asked the host. It's raining outside, so we had to finish our walk early, Peter said sadly. That's understandable. But why did you walk Fred? I asked Lisa to do that. She refused to take part. Apparently, she just doesn't like animals. Sorry, she kicked Fred with her foot. Peter explained, a little embarrassed. Jay was furious, but he didn't bother to find out who was right or wrong. Maybe she was lying. Maybe Fred had reacted badly to her and snapped at her. It could have been anything. Jay decided to just forget about the incident until after their wedding. It was as if he was wearing rose-colored glasses and didn't see the whole point of his sweetheart. It wasn't long before the big day arrived. Relatives began to congregate at the mansion. Slowly, the cheerful noise and lively conversations began. Jay liked this chaos. There was something native and warm in it. At last, Mrs. Gwinnett arrived. Mommy, 
At last, Jay exclaimed and hugged his mother tightly. He loved her terribly. Everything he had achieved, he owed to this woman. She had instilled in him mercy, kindness to people. She helped him to open the first charitable foundation in his life, and together with his deceased father financially helped as much as she could, as long as it was necessary for the young son. Sonny, come here and Mommy will give you a kiss, smiled the elderly woman. She kissed her son on the cheek and went into the living room where her favorite chair was waiting for her. Soon Hannah, Diane, and their other halves arrived at the house. Come here, my family. Gwyneth began kissing and hugging everyone. A nice, homey conversation began. Half an hour later, all the other guests had arrived, but there was still one behind the scenes. But Jay wanted to announce him a little later. How you've all grown. How good you are. Jubilee admired her all the while the relatives were talking to each other. Diana kept looking at her father. When he noticed her attention, he himself came up to her. Hi, honey. Jay said hello. Hi, Daddy. It's been a long time. Yeah, long time. There was a pause. And for Diana, it was the most awkward pause of her life. Dad, I want to apologize for... No. He interrupted her. Don't bring up the past. Let's just start fresh. I want us to continue loving each other, as a father and daughter should. The girl smiled and nodded in agreement. She didn't think it would be so easy to earn forgiveness, but she was glad for this unexpected event. She walked over to her husband and whispered in his ear, Daddy has forgiven me. Ray congratulated her, of course, though deep down he knew there was nothing to be happy about. The guests continued to talk until Jay tapped his glass. Ray immediately realized that this was it. Dear friends, we are gathered here today to celebrate the anniversary of my beloved mother, Mrs. Gwinnett. It was this person who gave me not only life, but also faith. Faith in the best. Faith that anything in this life is possible. As many of you know, our family has achieved everything with our own hands and our own minds. And first and foremost, thanks to my wonderful mommy. Everyone raised their glasses and drank to the health of the birthday girl. But that's not all. Jay continued. I want to tell you one more piece of good news today, on this happy day, when we are all here on such a beautiful occasion. I hope you will rejoice with me. He paused for a moment. A man has recently come into my life who has helped me to change many of my views on both life and art. That person is here now, outside the doors. I ask you to welcome him. He stood up and immediately opened the door and Lisa walked into the room wearing a gorgeous black dress. Please love and welcome. The beautiful Lisa. She's my fiancé. The room became so quiet that the breathing of Fred, who was sitting next to Mrs. Gwinnett, could be heard. No one dared utter a word. Everyone was struck dumb. Jay, of course, had expected something like this, but not Lisa. No one responded to this solemn speech, so she had a full-blown tantrum and ran out of the room. Jay immediately ran to catch up with her. The people in the living room stood up. That thing never let go of him. Diana said in an angry tone, but in a way that only Ray could hear. And the boy's heart sank into his heels. He felt like a dead, departing corpse. He didn't want to feel like that. He clutched, clutched his hand. And Diana noticed it. She yanked him down, started shaking him, screaming hysterically. You knew it. You knew that's why you didn't want to come here. Yes, you knew it all. Ray didn't answer anything. His eyes were unfocused, as if he had taken something. No one knows, maybe he had taken something to calm his nerves, but it seemed like the guy was overdoing it, because his eyes were staring into the void and his ears couldn't hear anything. There was only the ringing of his wife's screams. Jay came back alone, all frazzled and tired, after asking his fiancée for forgiveness. She's a complete idiot, Diana finished loudly. I thought we'd made up, she said, looking her father straight in the eye. Look, everybody, that blonde wants to steal his inheritance and he refuses to see it. She's half his age. All she wants is his money. I tried to save him from her once, but I've had enough. Diane took her husband's hand and led him toward the exit. As they passed under Jay, Ray whispered to him, I'm sorry. The front door slammed shut. Then came the sound of a car pulling away. Some, it had to be said, reached for it. Even Hannah, the other daughter Jay had counted on, turned her back on him. Hannah, wait, where are you going? The father pleaded, trying to stop his daughter. I'm disappointed in you. It was all she said, and she pulled her hand away, almost squeamishly. 
In the end, only Mrs. Gwinnett J. and a silent Fred remained in the room. What are we going to do? asked the mother. I love her, shouted Jay, red with anger. You're a fool, son, regretfully stated the mother. Your ex-wife was real. This one came in and gave me a heart attack. Where did you find such a butterfly? Mom, the grown son shouted fiercely. Gwyneth stood up, leaning heavily on the table, and without a word picked up her cane and walked out of the living room. Jay didn't stop her. He only asked his driver to take her home. So he was alone, apart from his faithful Fred, and he sank into a chair and stroked the dog. Once again we were alone, Fred. But his feelings for Lisa never faded for a moment. She came back in the morning, as if nothing had happened. Why are you like this? Jay comforted her as best he could. Why don't they like me so much? They don't even know me, Lisa cried. He hugged his bride and said, We're going to get married no matter what. Do you want to go pick out a dress next week? A dress? She had a big smile on her face. Yes, the bride should have a gorgeous dress and the groom a great suit. Lisa perked up. She was clearly intrigued by this proposal, and already in the afternoon she began to call different agencies that could hold her magical wedding. Three days passed. The situation had settled down a bit, but her daughter still hadn't contacted her. Jay didn't understand what they were so offended by and what his mother was offended by. They don't even know how beautiful Lisa is spiritually. Listen, honey, I've been invited to visit an orphanage, talk to the kids, give them a lecture. How's that sound? Jay suggested it. An orphanage? Lisa asked with a disgruntled look on her face. Yeah, I'm a sponsor. I told you about it. How long are you going to be there? Well, how? Children need to support, bring sweets, toys, new clothes and attention, of course. They need it all. This year a lot of people donated clothes to charity, so enough for everyone this time. Lisa hesitated but she put on a smile and went. Deep down she hated children and everything to do with them. But she had to pretend for Jay's sake. His eyes shone with happiness as he gave these kids candy, let the girls try on bright new dresses. Lisa, please help that girl over there put on that pretty dress. Jay asked for help. Lisa smilingly took that girl around the corner and started to put the dress on her. Oh my God, that dress is awful. You're too fat for it, she grumbled as she tried to dress the child. She tried her best to help the strange aunt, but Lisa put on the dress very carelessly. The girl was even a little hurt. It hurts me, she whimpered. Shut up. Does it hurt? You'll be patient. You poor brat. Angry Lisa whispered and slapped the child on the back with her palm with long and hard red fingernails. If only she knew who was standing behind her at that moment. Get away from the girl. A low bay suddenly commanded and Lisa turned around in horror. Jay was staring at her. He was terribly angry. Get away from the girl. He repeated. Like a fox, she sprang up quickly, glaring furtively, and stepped back a couple of meters. Get out of this building and wait for me in the car. I'll be back in half an hour, Jay said dryly. But Jay, I said leave. There was metal in his voice. Lisa didn't test his patience and walked out of the orphanage, cursing this girl and this day. Just as Jay had said, she got into her car and waited for her fiancé. Soon she saw him on the porch. He was fiddling with the teenagers, hugging them, giving them presents again. But Lisa wasn't the least bit ashamed. Yes, she had been rude to the girl, but she really didn't listen. Until they were married, though, Jay would call the shots. Lisa had already figured that out. But why do it? Why spend so much money on strangers? shouted Lisa to Jay throughout the car. She really didn't understand it. It's called kindness. Lisa, have you ever heard of it? You could have made a fortune if it weren't for all that spending. Every teenager out there has a cell phone. Because everybody needs a phone nowadays. We need it for our development. There are very kind, understanding kids in this house. They've never been abused in their lives, let alone heard screaming. I pay special people to make this orphanage thrive. I'll never understand you. They drove in silence for half an hour, and then Lisa said, Tomorrow we'll pay for the food, so give us our card. Okay, Jay said tiredly. His rose-colored glasses were beginning to break through. He was beginning to understand Lisa's nature. And then one night he had a plan matured. Hi, can you help? He asked his friend on the phone. Did you see what time it is? 
It's three yow, Jay, shouted an exasperated Jake. It's very urgent. Are you free tomorrow? Well, I've got a couple clients. Cancel them all. I'm coming to see you tomorrow, and you and I are going to do one actor theater. Jay hung up the phone and spent most of the night working out a plan. In the morning, he made Lisa an amazing scrambled egg king, put a note under her plate that said, Love you, and left on business, leaving a bank card on the table. He had come to visit an old acquaintance of his who had an old debt that needed to be cleared, and now, finally, the needed case had come up. Jake put him in the barber's chair, covered him with a cape, and asked with a smirk, What are we going to do? I'm going to be an elderly foreigner, for starters, Jay said with a smile. Lisa ate breakfast in the meantime and went to the bridal salon in a good mood. After a two-hour drive in traffic, she was terribly tired, but it was worth it. She was met by a smiling sales assistant. Good afternoon. Glad to welcome you to our boutique. Coffee for me. Hurry up, interrupted her Lisa, looking at the dress. Sorry, but we do not have coffee. We sell dresses. Do you have a boutique or some kind of market? Lisa was indignant. Coffee for me, I said. Poor shocked employee ran behind the curtain. Lisa continued to look at snow white dresses. Then some gentleman of obviously foreign appearance entered the boutique, wearing dark glasses, a beard, with a solid belly and a strange high black hat. God, what a freak. The girl's thoughts flashed through her mind. An employee returned with a plastic cup and handed it to Lisa. She looked at the cup with squeamishness and then at the saleswoman. What is this? Lisa shouted in her voice. You suggest that I pollute the nature, and at the same time, and your hands with this dirt? God, what kind of unscrupulous creatures went? Excuse me, I can pour. But Lisa took the cup away from her, or rather, almost snatched it from her hands. She took a sip of coffee and made a disgruntled face. You call that good coffee? The kind that came from the machine. The frustrated girl babbled. Lisa rolled her eyes and started looking at the dress again picked up the hangers and threw them at the employee like a shopping cart. The exhausted consultant caught it and dragged it behind her all over the hall. Some dresses Lisa dropped and did not deign to pick up. You, come here, shouted Lisa to the employee. She ran up to her, but not so willingly. Find me my size. Girl, you see, the thing is that these dresses are made to order. We make the dresses or tailor them to the customer's size. Well then, take my measurements or whatever it is you do. Do something. Yeah, right away. The employee ran behind the curtains, leaving Lisa alone with a man in the same room. Young lady, I apologize for intruding. And when is your wedding? He asked politely with an audible accent in his voice. Lisa looked at him vulgarly, with a note of arrogance. She assessed his clothes. A rather plain suit. This foreigner was definitely economizing on his appearance. Lisa noticed it immediately. None of your business, she snapped at him. Yes, I guess it is. Excuse me, one more question. I just have a wedding coming up, too. Can you tell me what kind of suit to get? You girls are always so good at this stuff. You don't need a suit. It's just a waste of money. And your wife obviously does not care. Liza grinned. Well, why are you so cruel? Sadly replied the man. I just wanted to make her happy. Man, get away from me. I'm busy. Imperceptibly, the stranger moved away and then left the salon altogether. It seems that Lisa really hurt him, but she didn't care. She was very nervous, since yesterday all this anger poured out on the people around her. A female employee entered the room with a measuring tape. She walked up to Lisa and started taking measurements. Oh, you're hurting me. Can you be careful? She shouted, twitching as if she had been pricked. I apologize. Apologized poor employee of the store. It seemed that she had already regretted a thousand times that she worked here. After a few minutes, she finished taking measurements and moved away from the nervous customer. She went to the cash register and began to write something down on a piece of paper. I wrote down your measurements, she announced cheerfully. Now you only need to choose a suitable dress. And Lisa again began to look through the assortment. From some of them she just frightened, somewhere on her face read disgust. After a few minutes, she concluded, no, I need something else. These are all awful. Then the store employee took a heavy breath and went behind the curtain again. She came out a few minutes later and brought a lovely dress. Lush, sparkly, embroidered with rhinestones, with delicate feathers on the bottom and angelic white in color. 
Oh, it's just right, Lisa concluded in delight. Check out. The saleswoman smiled. She was able to please even such a customer. That's what can be considered progress. She went to the cash register, calculated the advance payment, and wrote something down on her slip. Then she handed Lisa the card. The order will be ready in a week. If anything changes, please call, said the boutique employee. Okay. But her words were interrupted by a horrible smell of rotten fish. Lisa turned around and saw some drunkard in torn clothes. He was holding a real dead fish in his hands. Lisa couldn't believe her eyes. Honey, I want this fish back, shouted the drunk. By the reaction of the employee could be understood that she was just in shock from what she saw no less than Lisa herself. Man, you've got something mixed up. Here is a wedding salon, not a market. But the alcoholic did not listen. He came right up to the cash register, which made Lisa completely sick. She couldn't stand the horrible smell, so she snatched the card with their phone number from the saleswoman and, without even paying, ran out of the store into the fresh air. She breathed in the fresh smell of winter and felt better. But suddenly her calm was shattered again. Someone to her right rumbled. It was some horrible, ragged old beggar. Lord, they don't let a sick old man enjoy life. He was indignant, slamming and slamming these doors. So get out of here, it will be easier, shouted Lisa indignantly. It will not. Ragged old man, here at least give money. People like you should rot in prison. You bring nothing useful to society, only asking for money. Get out of here. Stop scaring people. And if you give me money, sweetheart, I'll go away safely. He smiled ingratiatingly and held out a dirty one. You know what I'll give you now? Shouted Lisa, kicking him under the breath with her foot. And then I'm gonna call the police. They will send you to the right place there and warmth and food will give. You're cruel. Why would you do that? I'm just having money problems right now. My son is suffering from cancer. I'm trying to feed him somehow and even a dime will help. Why don't you get a job, asshole? What am I giving you advice for anyway? You have to pay for my advice too. I'm not a free counselor. Have a good day. She sneered and went off to call her personal driver, the one Jay had given her at the beginning of their relationship. Evil always comes back. Suddenly he shouted after her. She stopped. She was infuriated by what he'd said. Lisa approached the man and spat on the pavement a centimeter away from him. I hope people like you will soon become extinct, she whispered threateningly. Stinking trash. Where do the police look? The homeless man clutched at his heart and began to grunt even more, leaning on one side. He seemed to be suffocating. Help, he whispered. I'm dying. Lisa listened to nothing. She summoned a driver, got into the car and drove home. Jay continued to pretend he was a poor beggar dying of a heart attack. Oh my God, can I help you, man? Need some help? Oh my God, you must be having a heart attack. The sales girl screamed while dialing an ambulance on her cell phone. But Jay stopped her with a wave of his hand. Don't, he said sadly in a different tone of voice. It's just that I was disappointed in an angel today. With a note of bitterness in his voice, he concluded and immediately got up off the pavement. The employee rushed back to the store and a few seconds later brought him some water. He drank it greedily. Thank you very much. He thanked the nice girl. I am very ashamed of my fiance. She spoke to you terribly. She's a terrible person, you have to admit. That's your fiance? The saleswoman was amazed. The tramp smiled and stood up from the pavement. He shook the snow off his clothes and stared at the boutique employee. She was standing in the cold in a short skirt and a thin tank top, her arms wrapped around her shoulders. He immediately caught up, threw his jacket over her, a clean one, and took it out of a nearby bag. The girl at first tried to refuse, but he convinced her. Don't worry, I borrowed this from an actor friend of mine. It's a perfectly ordinary jacket. There are no fleas on it. The pseudo-bomber smiled. He led the excited employee back into the store and asked, Can I ask you one favor? What is it? You see, yesterday I had a fight with my fiancé. I thought it was nerves. But during the night my eyes opened and I decided to give my future wife a test. I wanted to test her for goodness, for mercy. Unfortunately, this experiment was a complete failure. A failure in my personal life. I saw the true face of what I thought was a goddess. I'm so sorry. Why do you smell so bad? Suddenly the man asked, forgetting his request. The employee laughed. Some lunatic came in with a dead fish. She laughed. Now the whole store will have to be ventilated for two days. 
and then the girl looked at him strangely and suspiciously. Excuse me, I have not met you before? She inquired. Yes, I came into this store today in the guise of a foreigner. Maybe you saw a stranger with a strange hat here? Yes, yes, that was me too. The clerk was amazed. She didn't know people could transform themselves so professionally. It was real magic. Jay too smiled at the comical situation, but his frustration continued to gnaw at him. He couldn't marry a girl who didn't conform to his principles. After all, he's all about kindness. But she seemed to care only about his money. She did not know how to show sympathy for other people. He knew that now Lisa was going in the car with his driver to his ancestral home, but had time to do something. He called the driver, who was also his bodyguard. Plan B, Kenny. We have a plan B, he said. Copy that. He answered and disconnected. Jay realized that the next few hours would be the hardest of his life. He really wanted to marry Lisa, but it couldn't go on like this. She would be on his neck faster than he could say yes at the registry office. He arrived back at his mansion in the late afternoon. The clock read 10 o'clock. He walked through the gate and approached the house. Jay certainly didn't expect to see Lisa on the bench. He thought his bodyguard had done everything right. Then why was she still on his property? Jay! She shouted desperately as she caught sight of his figure. Jay had been raised well enough so he didn't ignore the girl. But he decided to keep his distance. He walked towards her with a confident gait and looked at Lisa with the most serious look and his face didn't express an ounce of emotion. Jay, your security guard has the nerve to keep me out of the house. What is this? I've got to get him fired, she complained. My security guard has never been wrong. He's not wrong now. You really can't go in the house, calmly explained the man. Lisa's eye even started to twitch from nerves. She didn't understand what was going on, and Jay was in no hurry to explain. He just remained silent for a moment, then strode toward the front door. Jay, Lisa yelled, what does all this mean? Jay had been waiting for that question. Answering it was terribly hard, but it had to be done. He must act like a true gentleman and leave her handsomely. He stopped, then turned around abruptly and looked her in the eye. Lisa, he said confidently, we can't be together anymore. The fire in the girl's eyes immediately faded. The confidence with which she complained so fiercely immediately evaporated. Fear and misunderstanding took its place. She collapsed on the bench and stared blankly at the stonework of the veranda. Jay was in terrible pain, but he knew it was necessary. He did not pity her. She deserved it. However, for the sake of support out of a sense of kindness, he stepped closer. Why? she asked. I was there, Lisa. I was in that bridal salon today. The bum you refused to give a few cents to. That was me. You were following me? She was outraged. No, Lisa. I just wanted to see your true face. Unmasked. And I saw enough. There was silence. Jay thought so. Lisa certainly had nothing to say. You're dumping me because I didn't help the poor guy? She laughed. You're dumber than I thought. Jay staggered back. Lisa sounded very grim, confident. She sounded like a madwoman, a devious plan that had gone awry. The man took two steps back from her, and Lisa, in turn, stood up resolutely. Yes, you may have seen my true face. I'm sorry I'm not as good a sheep as you thought. You must have dreamed I'd be a wonderful hostess and wife. Bullshit. That's ridiculous, Jay. What girl in today's world wouldn't think about money? Wouldn't be mercenary? Oh, you must have thought I was white and fluffy, that I wouldn't hurt a fly. You were wrong. I know who I am. No. I'm not proud of it. But I just don't see the point of giving my money to people who don't want to do anything themselves, who don't want to solve their own problems at their own expense. Do they think the world is full of fools like you? There are only a few like you. The rest of them are just trying to survive to get through the day. And I'm disappointed that you've never realized that in your whole life. That not everyone is as rich as you are. Your daughters have never seen poverty, never lived from paycheck to paycheck, never counted money, never shook at night from hunger. They're happy people. You and I didn't know each other very well, Jay said. It all went too far. It happened too soon. We don't know anything about each other. Maybe that's a mistake. Maybe that's a mistake too. Lisa agreed. 
But I know one thing for sure. I will always look for my own benefit. I don't care about the people around me. Why? I came into this world alone and will leave also alone. I have to rely on myself. You're wrong. No. Lisa squealed. No, I'm right. And I'm glad we broke up before we got married. I was getting sick of your kindness. She shoved him and headed down the stairs. Jay stood still and stared at the floor. Lisa started to walk away, but he managed to call out to her and ask, Lisa. The girl turned around. Tell me, were you even a little interested in art? Art saved me from poverty. Lisa answered briefly and walked away into the darkness of the night. Jay didn't see her call a cab, nor did he see her leave. He continued to stand on the veranda and stare at the floor. Just now he felt so insignificant and humiliated. Never had his kindness been portrayed in such a bad light. The days that followed passed like a blur. He asked his agents to deliver all of Lisa's things to her, but when they arrived at the right address, no one was there. Who knows where she had moved to? But Jay hoped she had a fresh start, though he didn't rule out the fact that she'd run off to find a victim again. He thought about her words for a long time. He realized that they so rarely had heart-to-heart -heart talks with each other that they didn't even know about each other's childhood, about what they had experienced. They knew nothing. It frightened him. How could he propose marriage to a girl he'd known for a month and a half? How had his wise head not realized such an obvious thing? It was just awful. A week later he went to the address of that bridal salon. There was another woman in the boutique. Hello, he said sadly. Can I cancel my order? Hello. Can you tell me what number the order was placed for? Jay called the right numbers. The woman looked at her computer but found nothing there. I'm sorry. When did you place the order? A week ago. Then she asked me to wait and went to the back. You served Elisa? That's the number. A week ago? I heard behind the curtain. Lisa? A voice asked. Yes. A woman came out of the closet followed by the girl he already knew. She recognized Jay immediately. Oh, it's you. Jay couldn't help smiling. He was pleased that this nice, kind girl remembered him. He was even a little embarrassed. Yes, I wanted to cancel the order, Jay asked. The girl immediately ran to the computer and began to process the cancellation. They were alone in the room. Did you cancel the wedding after all? She asked. Yes, I had to. We're very different people as it turns out, Jay replied. Could you tell me your name? The girl asked. Jay Sanders. The girl nodded. What's yours? As if in jest, the man asked. The girl looked at him suspiciously at first, then laughed. Caddy. She smiled. Katie took out some sheets of paper scribbled something with a black pen and handed it to Jay. Fill it out, please, she asked. The girl watched with interest as Jay filled out the papers. He was blushing more and more, but he seemed to enjoy it. Listen, are you free on Friday? Caddy suddenly asked. For you? Yes, Jay answered confidently. Six months had passed. A lot had changed in Jay's life during that time. He had a real relationship, which he was now working diligently on. He was in no hurry to propose to his Katie. She wasn't opposed to it herself. He had finally reconciled with his daughters, and they really liked their father's new girlfriend. She turned out to be the real thing, not a cheap fake like Lisa. That one, as it turned out later, didn't even have her own name. Katie and Jay matched characters. They had common interests, and most importantly, she was kind-hearted, sincerely loved the world. And he reciprocated. Jay couldn't enjoy watching her play with Fred, sitting for hours in his huge library, reading with a blanket. Still, some things in Jay's life remained the same. Every Friday he sat by the fireplace with Fred, and now with Katie, listening to classical music and watching the silent stillness of the trees that beckoned with their quiet beauty. Now he felt completely free and happy, and thanked fate for having once brought him to her. This girl possessed both intelligence and patience, and most importantly, the warmth of her soul. Do you think I'll be able to draw this tree? Asked Caddy, as they sat under the dark pine needles and read each his own book. I think it's worth a try. Ants were a jay with a smile, so Cat took up painting and enrolled it in the preparatory courses at the Academy of Culture. Lisa, on the other hand, achieved her goal. She married a rich German man who was temporarily living in the United States. A month later he took her to Germany, and there they were married. 
Two years later, Jay married his Katie. They had a simple, quiet wedding without lavish dresses and expensive spending, and everyone in the couple was very happy and content. I'm so glad, Dad, that you found your love. Hannah admired. After all the sorrows and troubles, they were all sitting together again in a family circle at Diana's apartment. She had just learned how to make wonderful pies, so she decided to celebrate with some good family gatherings. In fact, Mr. J. Ray said, I didn't give you and that Lisa girl a chance. Everyone laughed. I knew it was bullshit. But Katie is really a wonderful girl and I'm very happy for you. Thank you, my family. Jay wept, letting his feelings come out. Those were just the words I needed to hear. Thank you. And then they continued laughing, chatting, and just having a good time together. And as Jay looked at the quiet happiness surrounding him, he realized that he wasn't alone anymore. He now had everything he could ever dream of.